We're nearing the end of our section on phylogenetics, uh, and so for this worksheet, what I do like to do is talk about a little bit about where data comes from. We've already introduced Mega to you. You've been able to work with it a little bit. I'll be doing some more of that. You don't need to follow along. If you just want to watch the video, that's fine. If you'd like to open up Mega and follow along and do a little bit, that works also. So we've been using Mega to access data that is in a database. It's a federally funded database. NCBI is the National Center for Biotechnology Information, funded by your tax dollars. And it makes DNA sequences available to anyone who wants to and uh, anyone who wants to um, download them is freely available. So as before, I'm going to open up um, a new alignment. Okay, We're going to make it a DNA alignment. There we go. We'll open up a brand new one. And so we can access, and you can do this through any web browser. Mega has a little browser attached to it. When you click on one of these, this will do a search. This will open a browser window. So I'm going to open up a new browser window. By default, it just takes me directly to NCBI database. Now, I'm going to show you for a couple of the first ones. But before I do that, again, I'd like to talk about where this data comes from. Now, originally, the vast majority of data was gathered using targeted methods. And what that means is you look at other sequences that have been published. You design a primer, maybe a degenerate primer that matches a broad range of species. And you actually have two primers. And you do a PCR reaction to amplify a portion of the gene, usually a 1,000 base pairs or less. And for decades, that's the way that the vast majority of this data was gathered. So if you needed a bigger piece of a gene, Often you would do multiple PCR reactions that targeted different sections of the gene. You'd find the regions that lined up, and then you would make a representative sequence for that entire DNA sequence. And that was a fairly labor-intensive uh, process. So around the beginning of the new millennia, so the 21st century, um, so 2000s and on, we begin to have more powerful next generation DNA sequencing. And what this allowed us to do is rather than targeting a specific gene, you could sequence an entire genome. There's a lot of work and assembly. And initially, this was very, very costly. But eventually, uh, technology caught up and methods so that it became very, very cheap. And now, in many cases, especially if you want to gather a large data set, it's much cheaper to sequence an entire genome or an entire transcriptome. And then go back in and cherry pick or you know pick out the targeted genes that you want to use. And maybe even pick a whole bunch of them and evaluate them, and maybe pick the most useful ones based on that evaluation for your phylogeny. So the data that we're going to access may have come by various different methods, and you just should be aware of those methods. Um, if you're not familiar with a transcriptome, I'll give you a very brief definition, and we'll be talking more about them at a later date in the um, class. So a transcriptome is simply DNA sequence that is gained from looking at just the mRNAs. And there are a number of steps to go from that mRNA to the DNA sequence. We're not going to worry about those right now. But think of it this way. Your genome is your entire instruction manual. All of the genes, all of the non-coding parts of your genome, the entire thing. And that is a, is a very big 3.2 billion base pairs or so for humans. It's a very big piece of DNA. And there are some very repetitive regions. It can be difficult to assemble because of those repetitive reasons, regions. A transcriptome is a little bit different. And what we do with a transcriptome is we extract all of the mRNAs from an organism, and then we sequence them, and then we assemble them and put them back together. So instead of the entire genome, you only have that 1.5% that is protein coding. That's the max amount. If your sample doesn't include all of the genes, if all of the genes are not being used and expressed in your tissue sample, you won't even get that all of the 1.5%. But even though it's a smaller amount, it's very, very useful for a number of applications. And we'll leave that rest of that for later discussion. Okay, So 
for this data set, I'm just going to demonstrate the first couple, and then I'll build it larger. I'll pause the video and come back, and we'll demonstrate some of the things we can do to analyze this data that we have assembled. So I'm going to start with a group. Uh, let's pick a group. How about we do, let's just pick a random one. Let's do um, tortoises. We'll just do turtles. I'm going to use the scientific name, but you can do common names and that will often get you there. So we'll do a phylogeny of turtles. And I'm going to pick a gene that I know has been used before. You might, if you're unfamiliar with the group, you might need to do a little bit of work to figure out what genes are useful. Um, in fact, let's do this. Let's look at a complete mitochondria. So I'm going to click on this first complete mitochondrion that we have here. Uh, this is from the Galapagos giant tortoise. Uh, you can look, there's lots of information. Sometimes it gets a little bit uh, mind-numbing. It's a little tricky. But you can look here for the common name. Uh, and you can look for the, uh, sorry, the common name there, scientific name. If you're not familiar with it, again, hopefully you're familiar with it if you're doing this. And you don't need to follow along. If you'd like to or pick a different one, you can. And I'm going to choose 16S ribosomal DNA. Now, the sequence that we have here is the entire mitochondria. And I can add this to my alignment, but that's a big, big piece of DNA with many genes. So you can see the sequence here. To get just a single gene, what I'm going to do is click on this one. This is the 16S ribosomal RNA. It will highlight just the region I want. And then I can pick one of these formats back down here. I'm going to pick the GenBank format. And that will bring up a new window. When you scan down, even though it still has the same title, Complete Mitochondria, and you'll notice it only has that highlighted region. So now when I add this to my alignment, again, the default uh, name here is going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be whatever the sequence was done under. But I'm going to change it to 16S because I highlighted just the 16S. Okay. So I'm going to add that. And now in my alignment window, I have this DNA sequence. We can get rid of that first. That was just basically a placeholder one. So that's one way that you can find sequences. You can search by name. And you've done a little bit of this already. If you want to follow along, great. If not, don't worry. You don't need to make an alignment for this assignment. There will just be a series of questions at the end, three questions that you need to answer and submit for the completion of this assignment. So we can search for them by name, by gene name, by species name, and find the genes that we want. I'm going to show you one other way to access this. And you may be already familiar with this. I think we've done some of this in class. The second way we can do this is with what is called a BLAST search. So I'm going to start now with just my sequence. And I'm going to use this other link here. It will automatically load, if I've clicked on that sequence, it will automatically load the DNA sequence into the search window. I'm going to do an unconstrained search. But if I wanted to, well, let's constrain it, just so you can see how that's done. I'm only going to search for matches to this sequence in the turtles. There is the test to DNAs again. So now I've said search for this DNA sequence, but only use uh, matches that are within this taxonomic division, within what uh, we call the test to DNAs or the turtles. And it'll take a minute or two to search. It will bring back a series of results. That by default, it brings 100 results. And because this is a sequence that's already available on GenBank, uh, the first match will be 100% identity. You'll find the exact species and gene that I was just searching for. But if we had brand new DNA that we had just sequenced, we just found from a project we were working on, we could search it, find the closest matches, and that would give us an idea of what that sequence was. Okay? So. I'm going to scan down. Here are my matches. And you'll notice the first one has 100% identity. And it comes from, again, the same one we just did. And then there are other ones that are closer, maybe slight variation, the same species. And now we're getting a little bit farther afield. Okay, So same genus, the tortoise, the species of tortoises, but a different species. So I'm going to choose this one. And again, it's a complete mitochondrion. I'm going to click on the link to uh, that sequence, and it's going to load the entire sequence. And again, I, if I added this now, I'd add the entire um, mitochondrial genome, which is about 16,000, almost 16,000 base pairs long. So I don't need the entire one. I just want my specific gene. 
So I'm going to find again the RNA16S. This is a ribosomal gene that's in the mitochondria, so it's not protein coding. And once I've clicked on the gene and then the link to that gene, there it is, we're going to add it to the alignment. And again, I'm going to change the name here just because we didn't do the entire mitochondria. We only did the 16S version, so there we are. So now, in my alignment, I have two species for the 16S gene. And you'll notice they don't line up exactly. So we're going to do a quick alignment. I'll talk you through this. And I'm going to pause the video and add a dozen or so more species. And I'll come back and we'll talk about analysis. So quick alignment. You can use either of these algorithms. This is a cluster algorithm. This is a muscle algorithm. Both of them do fairly well. So there we are. So now, as we scan through our alignment, let's make this larger, larger, you will see that there are regions that are variable, and there are regions that are very conserved. And this is common for the 16S. It actually makes it a fairly useful gene to use for phylogenies, because you have enough similarity that you can do good alignments, but enough diversity that gives you information and data about species relationships. OK, so I'm going to pause the video at this point. I'll come back after I've added more sequences, and we'll talk about some of the methodologies and implementations in MEGA that we've gone over in our phylogenetics section. OK, so here we are. I've added uh, about eight more sequences here, plus an out group. Um, I targeted species from the genus Chilonoideus. It's a genus of tortoises. You can Google it, look it up if you want, including some from the, Dar uh, the Galapagos Islands. Um, and I put a, a member that is also a tortoise, but not part of that genus, as an outgroup here. I've done an alignment, and so you'll notice you'll see this pattern even more clearly. Areas where it's incredibly conserved, no changes at all, and then areas where there are a few minor changes. Now, notice that this one, there's a lot of similarity. There are only a few differences here and there. So if I was evaluating this, this one actually may not be the very best gene to use. Now, there's some diversity there, but there might not be enough to gather a lot of data here. We may even like a little higher level of diversity, but we'll see. We'll play around with it and, and see where we go. And it's fine for our demonstration purposes here today. Okay, So we're going to make this window a little bit smaller. Now, there are many programs that do this. Mega does it, and again, you don't need to follow along, and I'm not going to worry about you getting too familiar with it, because beyond this class, you probably not have uh, use for this unless you go on and do some graduate work or, or um, decide that this is really exciting for you and you want to go on and get a degree in uh, molecular phylogenetics. But there are lots of other ways that we can use this data other than just phylogenetics, so it can be useful to understand. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to data, and I'm going to activate it for phylogenetic analysis. It's going to ask me if it's protein coding, because this is ribosomal RNA instead of a protein coding gene. I say no, and that has some impact on to how we analyze it, whether it's protein coding or not. Okay, now what that does is it activates it and makes some of these options on the main window for Mega available. So now I can kind of, I can just put this away. Let's look at the main window here. Get it up there. And uh, we've got several options. We're just going to use some of the phylogenetic ones and show you a few of the things you can do with it. And then if you answer questions about what you saw here, you will complete this program, this project. You don't need to do all of this. Okay. So click on phylogeny, and I'm going to construct and test. Let's do a neighbor joining. We talked about neighbor joining. Again, this is a very fast uh, tree. Because we only have so few species, all methods will be very fast for this. But we're going to do that. It will do go, run through the neighbor joining process. And you'll see very, very short branch lengths here. We've got one kind of long branch length, which is that first one, which is a little, maybe even a little bit suspect, because it's so long compared to all the others. There might be something going on, and I may want to go in and verify that sequence if this was my project. Okay, could be it's really that different, but it's unusual that all these others would have such short sequences leading to them, and this one would be so long. 
maybe to put it another way to show you how this stands out, one of the things you can do on this window, you can interact with the tree. I'm going to root the tree to our out group, was this Geochelonia, which is the only one that's not in that, in that uh, genus. Oh, I think I have to do it right here. I click on that branch. And so now we've got it rooted here. And notice this one, how much it stands out, how different that sequence is from everything else. It's most closely related to other tortoises in the genus. So it may be very valid, but there's something weird going on there that would need to be investigated. Okay, So we'll leave that one open for now. I'm going to do a maximum likelihood tree also. So I'm going to come back here to phylogeny. I'm going to construct a maximum likelihood tree. We'll say yes. We'll leave all these at default. In reality, we might want to test the model of evolution, run it through, and check to see which one. Um, in fact, most commonly, even for small data sets, we're probably going to be at a little bit more of a complex one. But for our purposes of demonstration, again, not important. It takes a little longer, but it's very few uh, DNA sequences. And again, we see kind of the same pattern. I'm going to root it right there. And we see the same pattern. And notice the, the relationships might be a little bit different. So this just shows you that kind of the, the things that can occur when we do a different methodology. So here we have this long branch that is most closely related to Chelonoidus niger. Here it is Chelonodius, and it's not sister taxa to niger. It's related to these other organisms. So there are some slight differences. And again, data that does not have a ton of diversity and variability often is subject to these kind of fluctuations and differences between different analytical techniques. Okay. Last one. Let's do a maximum parsimony tree. Now by default, maximum parsimony is not going to give us branch lengths because it focuses only on relationships. We can still root it to the same branch. And again, if I was doing this project, I would carefully go over these, look at differences in arrangements, talk about why, maybe gather more data or realize, oh, this gene may not be best. Let's pick a different gene or at least add additional genes to my data set. Okay. So there's some other tools here. Uh, if you're if you were following along and you'd like to play around with them, you can do things like make a representative tree for our multiple ones. So this might be a subgenus. We're just going to give it a very generic name here, right? Oh, didn't like that name, putting a name on it. But that represents those three species I clicked on. I collapsed them, and so we could, we could kind of do an overview. And there are other tools here. You can uh, rotate um, the branches around to, to have different order without changing the relationships, a number of things you can do. And you can do other tests here. We can test, and for our purposes, we're not going to worry about all of these other tests. You can save images and export them in different formats. Okay, For you, I just want to kind of give you an idea. You're not going to be using this as a tool, but I just want to give you an idea of some of the things that people in the field might do. And Mega is just one program that can do this. OK, so to complete this project, uh, there is a worksheet with th three short open-ended questions. Go through those and, and answer them. They'll be about what you just saw. You can review, re rewind the video, watch it over if you need to, and submit those short open-ended questions. A couple sentences or uh, you know, three, two, three sentences is all you need to answer them. They're not uh, essay questions. Don't feel like you need to write a novel or a large amount of information to complete those questions. Okay, good luck.